The decision of the president from removal of subsidy to merger of exchange rates to appointment of advisors and checkup in the security hierarchy and suspension and investigation of the CBN governor and the EFCC chairman. The markets are already reacting to some of these decisions and we have continued to see some impact. Negative or positive? I mean, it depends on wherever you may be looking at dissecting these issues from. Tonight, I'll be speaking with a former Minister of Aviation, Mr. Osita Chidoka, to give his perspectives on the state of the nation in the last one month of the life of this country. Thank you so much, Mr. Chidoka, for joining us tonight. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. I mean, for someone who has served in the cabinet, um, a lot of people will say this is somewhat the honeymoon period for a president. But how critical is this period in the life of a nation? Uh, very critical period, um, very, very critical. Um, I, I saw you mentioned the key decisions he has taken, mm -hmm. the unification of the exchange rate, um, the removal of fuel subsidy, and all of these are product of the IMF Article 4 consultation with Nigeria. This is what the IMF asked Nigeria to do. And um, the President Buhari government did not have the gumption or the capacity to do them, so um, President Tinubu had taken quick decisions on them. But if you read the Article 4, where they suggested the removal of fuel subsidy and where they suggested unification of the exchange rate, they pointed out it was going to have serious effects on Nigerians and there is need for measures to protect Nigerians from these effects. So the bottom pyramid in Nigeria is going to witness a very, very dramatic change in their economic standards. So um, while the government is quick at adopting the IMF decisions, um, it doesn't appear to me that they have been quick in thinking about the impact it will immediately have on Nigerians and to reach out to Nigerians to ameliorate that impact. And that for me is the critical issue of governance. And that's the beauty of democracy. Because democracy is a government that you come to power based on votes on people. So those people that went out to cast their votes always have some demands. Um, from government. The fact that labor is silent, the fact that not much has happened in terms of reaction is because for eight years we had no government yeah. and there now seems to be a semblance of government. So people are going to do a wait and see approach. But in that waiting and seeing, um, there's a problem. The problem now today is that if you live in Maraba and you come to work in Abuja city, in, Meita, in say Wuse too, you probably were spending about 400 naira to get to work and now you're spending 1,000, 1,200 every day. And if your salary was 70,000 for a low wage and now 50,000, your salary has not increased. So um, I think that, and I believe we'll come to that, what I thought the government should have done together with this, because the, the history of IMF and its policies around the world, it's always good for the middle class, it's always good for the um, businesses, and sometimes it has devastating impact on the poor people of the country. So while I applaud the courage in taking those decisions, I'm still worried at the inability um, to think about the lock and step that will go with it, the decisions that will go with it to make sure that Nigerians um, feel, um, does not feel the full weight of the impact of this decision. So uh, feeling uh, yeah. the pinch and probably not drawing blood. Yes. Because I mean, there's a different thing that you feel a pain yes. and you're not bleeding from it. So, but the question now is, there are those who say, oh, well, we applaud the decision to remove subsidy, for example. And there are those who say, don't only remove it, but what about those who have stolen from the nation? Uh, oil theft, subsidy, scam, and uh, racketeering that have gone on. If you were Bola Tinobu, would you just focus on the future, or you would have to dig back into the, to the immediate past? Well, the past is already facing him because there's about $3 billion debt owed to the fuel importers. The four major companies importing fuel to Nigeria has a debt of about $3 billion. And they haven't been given enough crude to pay for those debts. So he has to pay the backlog of the um, debts. And there is to be some transparency to what has happened to get us to this $3 billion debt. How did we get there? So I see that he has taken effect um, act, action on the CBN governor, on the EFCC, Chairman, and I will come to that because I'm worried about the process and the procedure of doing that. Um, but I think that it is important that um, you look into the factors that has made it possible 
for Nigeria to accumulate this amount of debt on fuel subsidy. So going forward is a good strategy, but there are issues from the past already confronting the government. They need to pay this $3 billion owed to the four major suppliers of NNPC. They need to find the crude. Now, our crude production is not growing, and it has to grow in the immediate. So It grew just only for this, this month. In May, it yes. grew for the first time to about 1.3 million, yes. which we have never experienced yes. in almost two, I mean, almost more than several years. No, in about two okay. years. Uh, yeah. we experienced so we've been oscillating between 1.1 and 1.2. So yes, yeah. it's getting to 1.3, but that doesn't solve this problem because, you see, that 1.3 is not the full story. Mm -hmm. The full story is that the oil companies who are doing deep, sh deep sea, deep um, shore drilling are uh, all on PSC contracts. So they are sharing the crude. So it's not like the 1.3 is available. There are other you know, the joint ventures, the private operators, the marginal field owners. So it is important that the government begins to look at what has happened. And that is critical because if we don't increase the production, if we don't bring about a rapid rise in production and encouraging the country to be united again, because that is the key. The problem that we're facing today is not just about taking economic decisions. Um, countries have taken economic decisions and it has led to failure. President Macri came to power in Argentina, promising to end years of Peronism in Argentina. But in, a, in three years of his government, taking decisions, um, removing subsidies, increasing electricity tariffs, hitting the people with all those measures, he lost the election in, in less than five years. The country went back into a deeper problem. IMF had to build him out with $57 billion. That was one of the biggest um, bailouts we've seen in recent times. So, it is not just taking these economic sensible decisions. There is need to build national cohesion. There is need to build national trust. There is need to build a national momentum behind these decisions. Because it's not, going to, it's not just going to solve itself. Now, does, I mean, I remember vividly that in the early days of President Buhari, and this over eight years ago, and when he came, he came with a lot of a swirling acceptance from uh, a segment of the Nigerian people, uh, those who voted for him and who were hoping, especially because of the insecurity in the nation and the belief that this is a general who is a no-nonsense man, I was going to change things around and all of that. But sooner than uh, we knew it, when appointments started coming in, some Nigerians felt aggrieved about the manner in which and criticism came about an alleged nepotism of his, uh, his government on uh, how he made his appointment. But, I mean, you talked about cohesion and the need for a national unity. Does the Tinubu government in the last four weeks, has it shown any kind of sensibility and sensitivity towards inclusion and uh, principles of federal character? So, I will speak as... Um somebody who belongs to a party that is famous for his inclusion, the PDP. Um, the APC in its history hasn't shown any um, sense of sensitivity to uh, federal character principle. But I was in this country for the past eight years when the principle was brutally violated. Brutally violated. I came on this program, I spoke about the Federal Character Commission. I spoke about the fact that our, our whole paramilitary agencies 18 of them I could think of at that time were headed by people from one part of the country. I wrote several articles about Buhari's constant violation of our national agreed principles. And for most part, people rationalized it. People argued that he, he was appointing people he knew. He was appointing competent people. So I find it objectionable for people who did not say a word when this country was brutally um, harangued by a government to now talk about issues of appointment and sensitivity in four weeks. I feel that that's um, a violation of common, of decency. So what we need to see is that at the end of the day, the PDP plotted out a zonal structure that worked for it. So for us, the first six positions in Nigeria are the president, the vice, the Senate president, um, the speaker, the chairman of the party, and the SGF. Those are the six people that we normally give to the six geopolitical zones. So I want to see how the APC will do that. Already, the election has already given Southwest, Northeast. Uh, we're already seeing a South-South Senate president. Uh, we're seeing a North Central speaker and a North, a North Central um, uh, SGF and a North Central chairman of the party. So I'm waiting to see how the oh, APC yeah, will go to sort out that six. Then I'm waiting to see how they will do the six 
um, the ministries in Nigeria, whether they will grade them in terms of their um, effectiveness in governance. So for PDP, there were six key grade A ministries, six grade B, six grade C, and every zone got one, one, one of each. That way there was a sense of inclusion. In the paramilitary sector, military sector, so I think it's still early days for the president to talk about um, I, I wanted his appointments. To, yeah, I wanted you to look at uh, one of the areas that, uh, that some critics of the Buhari government came out vehemently mm -hmm. against him was his appointments of security, the service chiefs, yes. and critical security positions. I'd like you to look at um, how we tried as much as possible to place these appointments in the different region and state of uh, the uh, service members of the service chief. So if you look at it, for example, the NSA uh, yes. from the northeastern region of the country, uh, the IGP from the southwest, uh, and uh, the chief of army staff also from the southwest. So we see uh, uh, an appointment from uh, the uh, from the south 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 from the southeast and from the northwest. We are two there. So. From these, these are just uh, about seven or so appointments so far made within this sector. DSS, NIA, uh, there are no new appointments made in, in those respects. But from what you see on the screen, uh, does that sense that you, you're trying to portray based on also those political positions that have been held, those four, six uh, top positions, uh, does they agree with those sensitivities? I think they've been fair in trying to push the appointments around the country. I think it's been largely fair. But it's um, unimportant. Because it would have been totally unimportant if he faced what I consider the critical issues about Nigerians making their choices. For the kind of uproar that the election caused, the way he went after the CBN governor is the way I think he should have set up a panel to look into the INEC. Yes, because you see, he has won the election. They've declared him winner. The courts are going on. And we are very, um, we are watching carefully what's going to happen in the courts. Because you see, when there is national consensus behind a leader, this spills into insignificance. This is unimportant because here I can see every zone is appointed. But what does it mean to you and me on the street? It means that we are looking for security. We are looking for to be able to travel from Abuja to Kaduna by road. We want to go from Lagos to Ikiti by road. That's what concerns us at this time. But the 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 reaction I see is because of the trauma we suffered of the eight years of Buhari's insensitive government. And more important now, with the challenge that has come with the election, with the deeply divided election, and the president must always remember that he ended up with 30-something percent of the voters. So it's a minority majority. 60-something percent of the voters said no. So in, in trying to win back the people's confidence in our electoral process, in trying to win back our people's trust, that what matters is who do Nigerians want to elect. And once we elect him, we will trust him. Because you see, the Nigerian constitution is such a beautiful one. You cannot be president of Nigeria without winning across Nigeria. Mm. You must get 25% in 25, 24 states. You must. That's the first, after winning majority of votes, you must get 25%. So, meaning that every president already has a pan-Nigerian mandate. So what is happening here is that for us to trust that that president is our president, we've elected him, we must trust him to take decisions about bringing people who will carry out the job while respecting our national diversity. So I, you would like him to probe uh, uh, the 2023 election and, and what happened. Yes. Uh, I mean, on one hand, one would think that favored him. Yes, uh, yes, yes. On what justification? I mean, legally if speaking, if favored, the only... If favored President Yeradua and he set up a panel to mm -hmm. look into INEC, how do we make sure that servers don't get turned off? How do we ensure that results are uploaded as promised? What did INEC promise? What did they deliver? Those are not the issue of whether he and, won or and lost. And again, one would also yes. look at the fact that there is a legal process ongoing. It, it doesn't matter. Won't, won't that uh, also affect? No, it doesn't affect. matter. It doesn't matter the legal process. Because President Yeradua made that point. What is happening in the court is a different matter. You present evidence, the courts listen to it. But what is more important is getting Nigerians behind you to say, I won this election. I hear the issues people have raised. And I think that our election shouldn't cause this kind of issues. I mean, Brazil just elected Lula. Nobody is questioning the election. Israel just elected Netanyahu in a very divided election. Nobody is questioning the electoral process. 
People are questioning people's decision to make those choices. But nobody is questioning the electoral process. So that's what needs to stop in Nigeria. We need to stop questioning the electoral process. If an independent panel looks at this and advises going forward, this is the type of work we need INEC to do. This is how the political parties should be present when INECs are taking decisions. This is the system to improve what we already have. Then that will make it that after an election, Nigerians will just be wondering about how did you manage to get people to vote for you? Not that the system itself was rigged mm. to help a candidate. You, you, you think so if Balatinobu does that, yes. we give him some sense of... Um, uh, oh, immediately. Yes. It will galvanize Nigerians? It will galvanize Nigerians. If Nigerians know that the process of electoral decision... So we know that even if the courts rule otherwise, and now we are watching to see how the courts will rule, we know that we can vote him out if we want to. The idea that he can't be voted out, the idea that the electoral system will always be skewed in the incumbent's favor, makes a mess of our democracy. It damages, that is what is causing this uproar, because the appointments, as you've shown, reflected parts of the country. But I hear people complaining. I am of the view that, don't complain if you didn't complain in the past eight years. Mm. But those complaints are because our sense of national cohesion is at its lowest ebb. We need to bring our, we need to think beyond politics. When politics is over, the decisions he has taken, for instance, I'm wondering, when you took a decision to remove fuel subsidy, and you've removed the fuel subsidy, and the fuel subsidy, the fuel prices rose by from 100 and something naira to 500 and something naira in a day. What are the immediate measures that can be taken to make sure there is more cash in the pockets of people who go to work every day? If, if, I, was, if I was thinking with him, I would have said immediately, Three things I can see my, in, immediately. I said, remove the charges for bank transfers in Nigeria. The 26 Naira and the 56 Naira, cut it immediately. That money goes to the banks and they're just enriching themselves. They've made a one-time investment. The banks are charging us for account maintenance fee. They're charging us for sending SMS. SMS. They're charging us for, um, they call it COT on mm -hmm. transactions. So why are we paying for transferring monies that belong to us? We're paying 26 Naira and 55 Naira. Remove that immediately. Or make it a flat rate of once a month, you can charge 100 Naira for IT support. So that puts more money in the hands of people. Second one is that our pension scheme has accumulated a lot of money. And that pension scheme now requires people to pay, I think, 12% of their salary, 12% mm -hmm. uh, from, so the, from, from, the, the employers, from the employer's yeah. side. So I'm thinking that you can reduce the amount the people are contributing for a one-year period to allow more money or six months, depending when your ministers will come, when your government will do this. So that way, immediately from the salary, next month's salary, another 10,000, 5,000 Naira, 10,000 Naira, as the case may be, enters into the pocket of the people who go to work every day. They are able to pay their transport fare. But they need to go to work tomorrow. We can't wait till when you take a yeah. decision on how to ameliorate the suffering. I mean, when you talked about the review of the processes in INEC and the post, uh, the uh, post of the 2023 election. INEC says it will begin that process in another few days. What do you make of INEC's decision to do that? INEC has no capacity to do that. INEC is a disappointment as an agency. The INEC chairman and the INEC executive, I'm totally disappointed in them. I do not trust any process that will come from if them. If you had your way, what would you do with INEC? I will remove the INEC chairman immediately. Uh, what would you say on what basis? Uh, for just not delivering on the electoral process, for not just delivering, for creating this kind of um, uh, system where the elections that has happened in this country, the whole international community that observed it said something was wrong with this election. This election did not meet the standards. 2015 remains a watershed. 2019 was less than 2015, and 2023 is almost worse than the 2019. Why are we on this path of dissent? Let me take you to uh, Emefiele Ambawa. You seem to have a grouse about the process yes. of the arrest and investigation. Yes. What do you think went wrong? I, 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 it's um, when the central bank is an independent organization, we have to be careful how we treat the people who occupy those positions, even when they act in an egregious manner, even when they do something wrong. The reason being that we don't want to intimidate occupants of that office. Using the secret police to go and arrest them lie them in, share videos of handcuffs, getting the EFCC chairman to come to report to the DSS um, makes it difficult. I mean, I can't understand an FBI director under investigation. He will be investigated by the FBI. They have an ombudsman. They will have an a internal process, process. An internal process. 
After which, if they find him guilty of any misbehavior, they forward it to the police for prosecution. I'm disappointed that we're still thinking in this gangster method. We saw Magu removed as chairman of AFCC, arrested in broad daylight with guns, with police. Everybody, he's a police officer. He could have been invited to police headquarters and told, hey, sit here, we're, going, we're taking your statement. Why that show? And then afterwards, the government went ahead and promoted him to AIG. So I don't even know where and this there was went. a Justice Salami yes. committee, committee report, yes. which was never made public. Never made public. And if you look at, I mean, the, I mean, you look at the EFCC, for example, Ribado, the first EFCC chairman. Yes. He never, yes. Uh, he didn't, he didn't spend out his, the, no, no, the, his never, term. Nobody finishes his term uh, in the EFCC. Uh, 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 Farida yes. Waziri uh, never spent out a term. Uh, Ibrahim Lamode, Lamode never spent out. Ibrahim Malgo never yes. spent out. And now Man, uh, yes. the young man, if, for the two-year-old uh, uh, Bawa, Bawa yes. is also gone. So uh, there are those who believe that there is something wrong with that chair and is in, perhaps he's been bedeviled or cursed by these uh, incessant no, manner in which they have removed. Not I mean, perhaps, I mean, you've been in the civil service, the yes. core of the civil service, yes. to becoming a head of an agency and becoming a minister. So you understand some of these processes. Well, give us an understanding of what could be done. Um, uh, and the FCC chairman seems to be a very, one of the most powerful people as soon as he, they assume office. Mm -hmm. But then, in an inglorious manner, they are being removed from office. What could be done to salvage that office? Nothing is wrong with the office. What is wrong is our Nigerian um, leadership mentality. When Bawa assumed office as AFCC chairman, I wrote him an open letter. And I, in that open letter, I warned him. I said, I'm writing this letter because, like you, I became a call marshal at 35, so I know how it is to be young and head an agency. So I gave him some tips on how to survive. I said, the government of the day will want to use you. Be careful, because there will be a day of reckoning. But I don't think that's the issue. In a democracy, these institutions should have processes for adjudication and trial of their members. The ombudsman system is lacking in our key independent institutions. There is no need for president or the DSS to order arrest and capture you and manacle you. It's just not right, because you see, when people looked at what happened to Magu, what happened to Farida, what happened to Nuhu, everybody is afraid to do the work of fighting corruption. Don't forget, the EFCC chairman is supposed to be investigating, including the president. Now they are intimidating them. The police commissioner in Israel is investigating Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He's investigating him. He even won election again, and he's going to see if he can change the law from the courts. But the police commissioner is of the view that I have three investigations before me, I will conclude them. So even when the government, even when Benjamin Netanyahu cried out and said, this is political witch hunt, the commissioner said, no, please face your business. It's not, we're here to do our job. And All over the world. There are those people, who say also, I mean, uh, some anti-corruption uh, crusaders uh, have said, look, uh, whenever some of these heads of uh, EFCC at some point, when they take on very powerful politicians mm. or politically exposed person, they get into trouble. And so sometimes that's the consequence of uh, the, the, the so inglorious man in which they are We're not serious removed. about fighting corruption. So that's why I said the president ought to have given out a new tone. He ought to have, if um, I was advising a president... And, um, and I said, I will have said, no, give out a fresh tone. Let there be petitions written against the chairman of EFCC, mm -hmm. even if it is by the government to the EFCC board, and ask them to investigate this egregious behavior, these activities of the EFCC chairman, that activities of the governor of the central bank. In the Central Bank Act, the chairman is the, the governor is the chairman of the central bank board. So there must be a process in the act, and we should amend the act to reflect this, that says, in the event the chairman is subject of investigation, uh, who takes over as chairman, who acts in his stead, what is the disciplinary process? Because we must maintain the independence of these institutions. How would the newly appointed uh, EFCC chairman try to investigate the president, his wife, his children, or the vice president, or the Senate president? But they've seen what has happened to Bauer. You could end up from your office in the morning down to a dungeon cell in the night. And I'm not saying that he hasn't done anything wrong or he will not be found guilty. I am saying 
that that process sends wrong signals to everybody. Mm. And the future civil servants, it started from General Montala Mohammed. Since he sacked civil servants over the airwaves, civil servants have become to acquiesce to political office holders. They have since learned to find out ways to give them soft landing, help them do whatever they want, and leave. Because civil servants used to be independent. They used to tell the ministers, you cannot do this, you cannot do that, because you know, they are the custodians of the law. They are secured by their tenure. But now that we have a situation where you could wake up in the morning and remove the EFCC mm -hmm. chairman, I'm, I'm sorry that that will give uh, wrong signals. Uh, uh, and that consequence also is not only on some of these that I have mentioned, even the appointment of judges, yes. appointment of the INEC chair, yes. appointment of the IG of police, appointment of the EFCC, ICPC, and a host of other government agencies like that that are supposed to be playing independent roles. Mm -hmm. But when they are politically appointed, the question is, who are they loyal to? Are they loyal to the nation and to the law or to the appoint, uh, appointor? So I believe that in a presidential system, the president should appoint those people. I believe that. I think the power of the president to manage the executive, to determine who will work with him. But then his power ends in certain independent positions once he makes the appointment. The removal then becomes a different process. He cannot have that power to just simply, um, in certain positions, he needs to go back to the Senate or something. But beyond that, there should be a convention there should be that sense of legalism. Despite it looks slow, it looks that it's a slow process, it doesn't show you're a strong president, but there is an important dimension to showing the respect for legalism, to saying we have these concerns about the EFCC chairman, a report is made to the board of the EFCC, the ombudsman, the people who have power to discipline him, and if they, if they find him guilty, then we will forward it to the police. And he will not run away. Nothing will happen. The country will not dissolve. What will happen is that future, appointers will, future appointees will know that they are secured in the work they do. Mm. They will know that for them to be punished, they have to do something bad. So if you don't do anything bad, you're sure that you're secured in your office. So I was going to ask you about the effects and outcome, uh, the implications of some of these decisions, the subsidy, for example. Mm. The attendant consequences that we've seen, rise in the cost of uh, transportation, and you had said that there should have been some uh, foundation laid before that policy decision was made. Now that that has happened, it doesn't look like they're rolling it back, although Labour has said, they need to go back to status quo, but I'm not seeing that happening. I don't know. <laughs> but now that this has happened, going forward, I mean, what do you think could be done? So um, I, I think that there is an immediate need to begin to ameliorate the impact of this. And one of them, I think, and let me outline it um, the way it comes to my mind. The first thing I would have wanted to hear was government's conversations about the cost of running government. Mm -hmm. um, I would have loved to hear that the National Assembly, uh, the new people coming in, um, the cost of housing them and doing this is taking a 20% cut on what we paid the last time, just to make sure everybody is getting the pinch of what we are doing. Uh, I would have loved to see something that nobody is having the conversation about in Nigeria. Every time the president signs a new legislative act, most of the acts coming from the legislature are creating new agencies. So I haven't heard anybody talking about a freeze about creating new institutions. We are creating new institutions with every new act, the National Assembly. I mean, not every, but for most of the acts that has to do with institutions, they are creating new ones. Um, so I'm thinking that there should be a conversation about um, continuous growth of the federal government. The federal bureaucracy is growing wider and wider and needs to be hemmed in. Um, so that's one. Number two is that I think the government should have thought about quick fixes. I mentioned the first one cutting the cost of money transfer, doing everything that is costing Nigerians money and putting that money back in the pocket of Nigerians. So I think removing that cost and also doing something about personal income tax. Um, if I were to advise, I would say there should be a cut on personal income tax. And then as the government is envisaging increasing electricity tariff, as the government is envisaging removal of fuel subsidy, um, so the deductions at the end of the month for taxes, for pension, 
and I believe the government should, at least for a one-year period, um, reduce the, the part contribution of the, uh, of the workers. So that way, people get more money in their pocket in the immediate. And then within the period when the economy begins to stabilize, for those who are going to work every day, for those who work in the organized private sector, and for those who work in the unorganized private sector, the informal economy, um, I'm of the view that the government should have also thought about the, the previous program of conditional cash transfer, unconditional cash transfer. But that, for me, will not solve the problem in whole, but people need to get some money in their pockets now to pay the bills today. The bills are not going to be paid in three months' time or six months' time. The bills are being paid today. And then lastly, because I, I wanted to get this point, agriculture is the mainstay of Nigeria. So announcing wide and far-reaching policies, security policies, to secure our farmlands, to secure that people can go to the farms, people can produce agricultural produce, and people can bring it out to sell, um, will be a major step in the right direction. So that at the end of the day, as we are witnessing, as this is happening, the removals of this subsidy, the, um, the unification of the exchange rate, which I think makes a lot of sense. I don't know why anybody should have the power to allocate anything to anybody. I've never, I've lived in many countries and I've never had anybody saying, I'm going to buy dollars because I'm traveling. No, people just travel. They hold their cards from their banks. If the dollar is 700 naira on that day, that's what it exchanges. If you want to spend your money, that's what you spend. If you want to send your child to school abroad, pay the 700 naira. That's the cost. So I think that we need to um, quickly move on those things. But more important, um, take and the empathy, the social impact of these decisions. That is the beauty of mm -hmm. government. Government is not just about the bottom line. Government is about people. I think I'd like to anchor on what would be your own suggestion because there are conversation on the minimum wage. Yes. Uh, what would be your own suggestion on the, on the MAC, the, the, the new uh, minimum wage? No, I think the minimum wage needs to rise. To like how, yes. how much? I wouldn't know. I wouldn't go into numbers because it has to be driven by the data of the devaluation, the inflation rate, um, what the government revenues will look like. Because if you are removing the subsidy and saying you are freeing up this amount of money, we can't put it all back again into servicing the recurrent, the, the wage bill of the government. We need to put it back also to infrastructure, to things that will benefit the larger part of society. So I think there is need to uh, do those numbers mm -hmm. and look at the cost of living index and then move to that direction. Finally, you've been in cabinet, you've been in government before. This government, and they've said, Mr. Alaki said that, look, they, they're getting a lot of reaction and embrace from uh, some global leaders. And some people will say, well, it's still early in the day, but if there is any note of warning that you would like to sound tonight from someone who has been in that corridor before, what would that be? And don't listen to the international community. Don't. They, are not, they didn't vote you. They're not going to put money here. They're not going to put any cash here. They all like what the IMF is saying, unification of um, this, because they want their businesses to come in here and do business and go. They want their airlines to transport their monies back. They want their oil and gas companies to take their money back. They want to buy Nigerian bonds and make profit on them. So please, our interests with the international community at times are divergent. We need them. We need their support. We need them to, but we shouldn't get carried away with what the international community is saying. We need to get worried about the lack of cohesion in Nigeria. We need to be worried about the inability to get the momentum for these policies. One of the leaders I want to advise the government to look at is Modi, Narendra Modi. He's managed to get Indians behind him. There are complaints, of course, about his high-handedness, about his Hindu nationalism, but the majority of Indians feels that the economy is moving in the right direction. So what is important with a leader is, yeah, people, let us not be confused um, about traveling the capitals of these worlds, thinking anything will change. The United States is not going to put any money here. The Chinese will do, but for their own business interest. So what is important for us is that once people see a country that is cohesive, that is united, secured, and making sensible economic policy, the international community will do business with us. Mr. Osita Chidoka, our former aviation minister, thank you so much indeed for these conversations. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you so much indeed.